So welcome back to For the Culture right here on WEAA 88.9 FM and WEAA.org. Absolutely, the voice of the community. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for checking in and riding with me this evening. Folks, I am very, very excited about um, our next part of this conversation because we want to talk a little further about what we started which is, the, we, you know, we're talking about how to get yourself back into a good financial shape to be able to really wield some power. And so my next guest, they're going to share with us as we have started talking about credit card debts, but they're going to shift the gears and say, let's have the conversation, a much more extensive conversation, talking about land, talking about home ownership, and talking about how we can get out of this economic poverty that we uh, too often find ourselves in. So I'm very, very excited to be welcomed bending back to the airways of For the Culture here on WEAA. I am joined by the executive director of NEHI, Mr. Garrett Good, who's going to talk to us a little bit about this idea of a community land trust and then I'm also joined by my dear sister, Sister Denise Jones Dorsey, to give us some more insight about why it's important for us to not just talk about investing into the land, but how we can really do it, even if you're making $15 an hour. Okay. What? Are you serious? I can I can get power at $15 an hour? Don't take my don't take that slogan, brother Garrick. I see your face, sir. <laughs> don't take that slogan. You can get power at fifteen dollars an hour, brother Garrick. Good, this is Denise Jones Dorsey. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, brother Garrick. Let's talk a little bit first and foremost. What's your take on this latest uh, announcement coming from the banks that they really are concerned that credit card debt is being paid off, and so they are making an effort. You're talking about your Capital One, talking about Discover. You're talking about those major banks that issue credit cards to millions of people across this country, especially to black and brown communities that are saying we need to do something about getting more revenue in. Because even during a pandemic, people are paying down their debt and they don't look like it will um, it will go up anytime soon. So what's your take of this? Um, I think people are being you know cautious and making sure that they are prepared, as we've seen you know, the continuation of the housing crisis with um, people not knowing where their next check is coming from or if they'll be able to continue to pay rent uh, and things of that nature. So they're, you know, are making sure that they're gonna have more money on hand to be able to do the things they need to do to survive. And that's why it's so important that uh, as we step back and reflect on the opportunities ahead of us, that we look at housing and how we can convert our current situations of renting into home ownership so that we continue to build wealth and create a, more secure and stable uh, situation with our housing situation. So, 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 is it surprising that people are able to pay off the debt? One of my listeners checked in on my Facebook page and said, because of the stimulus checks, because of tax refunds, is putting people in a better position. I don't know if President Biden had that in his mind when he pushed this big, you know, the big uh, um, stimulus package through that that people would use it to pay off debt. Because paying off debt, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, paying off debt is good for the consumer, but it's bad for business in some cases. So, so is this surprising that this this this, this downward shift is happening? Raji, it's bad for investors. What, bad for what investors. is happening is, is that our yeah. community is looking at its own security and safety. So it's doing what it's always done. It has taken its resources to invest in its security and safety. With the pandemic, our lifestyle changed. And as our lifestyle changed, we had more disposable income and decided to place that income in a place where we are safe and secure. Mm -hmm. I am so thrilled to be back on WEAA with you, Brother Faraji, to give the community an update on what's been happening with the Community Land Trust which is an initiative that was created by our people across the country to control land. Because what we're clear about is, is that power 
is inextricably linked to land. Mm. That's why our forefathers worked the land, fought for land, were burned off the land because power is equated to land. About seven years ago, as your listeners may recall, a group of community people of which I'm one, I'm not a developer, I'm not a contractor, I'm not sure I know which end to hold the hammer. We came together to figure out how we could change the blight in our neighborhoods to reinvest in our communities so that our communities will be communities of power. And the community land trust model emerged which is simply the community holds the land for the public good. I'd mm-hmm. like to, sh- to lateral back to Mr. Garrett Good to tell you all about the land that we've acquired, the houses that we've built, the plans we have moving forward to build more housing in the four by four community. Garrett, would you be kind enough to share with this audience? Cause I'm busting at the seams. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I am happy to um, report that we currently have three families on the contract for home ownership, um, where we've, we're seeing families average about five or six hundred dollar a month payments. All of our homes are two and three bedroom homes uh, under one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, in which we have an allocation of subsidies that we can apply uh, to bring that price down even deeper. Uh, we have. Um, two houses that are on the market, went on the market just this week um, that we're making showings for. Um, and we've got about 15 families that we're working with that's looking at home ownership. And we have about eight additional homes that are currently under construction, somewhere in the construction process to be released um, sometime early, late spring, early summer um, for, um, to be bought uh, in the Baltimore community. And we're currently in the four by four off of Bel Air Road. Uh, and we are working with the community to set priorities um, to look at not only home ownership, but looking at making the community better. Uh, and the two priorities that they've identified is um, crime and uh, trash. And so we're looking at how to improve the community and bring up the level of uh, crime prevention uh, through home, home ownership, as well as to um, policing, community policing, uh, as well as we're looking at um, trash collection and making sure that everyone's picking up and keeping the community beautiful. Uh, we had we launched a campaign called 4x4 is Beautiful with uh, Neighborhood Design Center. Mm-hmm. And so we have many things that we have happening. So uh, Baraji, uh, yes, I have ma'am. promised that I would share with people how you could be earning $15 an hour and own yeah. a home. Right. Jared, we just mentioned to you that the mortgage payments that we were looking at are between five and $600 a month plus your utilities. Here's the story. If you're earning $15 an hour and you're working full time, that means that your annual gross income is about 31.2. Usually a bank, since we were talking about credit, will give you credit at $90,000. The question is, where can you buy a house in the Baltimore metropolitan area for $90,000 that is not a fixer upper? Right. Because the community controls the land, we create what's called permanent affordability in our homes. So what we do is we're developing our homes. Right now it's at 145 market. However, because this is community controlled, we're able to provide subsidies at the uh, settlement table to the homeowner so that they can buy that home at $90,000. Now, they have to commit to staying in the house X amount of years because we don't want them to walk away with the equity. Also, in addition to this, this is a shared equity strategy. So at the time that they do decide to sell, they will receive a portion of the equity and the remaining equity remains in the community land trust. And we pass on that savings to the next family that wants to purchase a home. This is a no brainer. Sister Denise, and this sounds fantastic. So how many homes are available within this community land trust? Right now with Nehi, Garrick, you can answer that question. But before Garrick does, I want to also make sure the listeners know that Nehi is one of a network of community land trusts in Baltimore City. We have okay. a community land trust in South Baltimore, which serves Curtis Bay and Glen Burnie. 
We have a community land trust in Cherry Hill, Westport. Uh, we have a community land trust um, fledgling in Remington. So the point is, is that this strategy is in the city of Baltimore and promises to grow across the city. Individual community land trust because the C in community is so important to us because we want grassroots community leaders like myself to be in control of our destiny because we believe that African-Americans have all the resources, all the intellect, everything they need to make this work. In fact, if you follow the gospel of Mr. James Brown, all I want you to do is open up the door. I will get it for myself. Garrick, will you share with him what we have in the pipeline right now right. and what we anticipate to have by the end of this calendar year, please? So our goal is to, we currently have about 15 houses that we uh, have available um, that'll be available in this quarter. And then we have a, a total of about 25 that will be available this calendar year. And we're on a path to acquiring uh, as well as selling 200 homes over the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, so by 2025, our goal is to have done 200 homes in Baltimore City. Folks, if you're just tuning in to For the Culture here on WEAA 88.9 FM and WEAA.org. Tonight, um, I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Tonight, we've been talking to Mr. Garrett Good uh, and Sister Denise Jones-Dorsey of the Northeast Housing Initiative here in Baltimore, talking about the value, the significance, the power in community land trust, and how even if you just get paid $15 an hour, you have an opportunity to own a home in Baltimore City. Not a fixer-upper, a real home on just $15 an hour. So for those who are in that situation, financial place, and you're saying, I'm tired of renting, I'm tired of you know, you know, couch surfing, I'm tired of living with this relative or that relative, have you ever considered owning a home as part of a community land trust? This is an alternative for so many folks, especially within black and brown communities, to finally get some power with owning land. Join me in a conversation, 410-319-8888, 410-319-8888. Garrick, I, I want to get back to you because I've talked to realtors, I've talked to my realtor, just because I'm, I'm just interested. I'm, I'm curious like that, Garrick. And I'm wondering, because I'm hearing this is a seller's market, uh, this is a market that, you know, there are the demand for homes is high, but the supply is low compared to where people. So you got a lot of people that want to buy houses, you know, right now, but then the good homes are just taken up. They just getting snatched left and right. And I'm even hearing, Gary, and I'm sure that you probably heard, you and Denise heard the same thing. Some people are paying over list price. My realtor told me people are paying as much as $20,000 over list price. Mm. They're not getting any type of seller's help. And the sellers are 90% of the time are just wanting to do as is contract. So I'm thinking to myself, well, who would want to buy a home under those circumstances? But talk to me, how does this, how does this uh, owning a home within a community land trust fit in what's go currently going on in this market? Well, good, quick question. The way that it fits into the uh, buyer's market is, yes, it is It is a seller's market, excuse me, uh, is that we have the only homes that are currently available on the market that are under $150,000 that you can get completely rehabbed, new with new appliances, new uh, HVAC, and just move in ready. Um, we don't go, our price is our price. Uh, the, um, we look at driving that price down based on eligibility to ensure that people are not mortgage poor. And what that means is we work with the family to make sure that your income, insurance, and all those things don't exceed 30% of your income. So therefore you're not, you know, you may at some point be on a waiting list um, to get a home, but you're going to still get a home at a price that's fair as well as something that's affordable and something that will meet your budget so that you can build well, so that you can live comfortably and have a house that you're proud of and does not need a lot of repairs and a lot of additional resources from your check every week to be able to live in it. 
So, and you call it and you and brother Garrett, you call it what what kind of poor? Mortgage poor. Mortgage, mortgage poor. poor. Where and folks are paying more than 30% of their income for their mortgage and utilities. Faraji, but what we're talking about to some of your listeners may fa sound fantastical. Let's talk about where do we get the money to do this? And there are two places. You just talked about investors are looking for an opportunity to invest money because debt is going down. We are finding private investors and banks who are interested in investing private capital in the community land trust movement across the country. The other thing is, is that here in Baltimore, only four short years ago, the citizens of Baltimore created what is called the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. When the city mothers and fathers could not figure out where to find money, to create affordability, the community did the research, mm -hmm. found that there was an opportunity called a transfer of a recordation tax. So there's no more taxes on us. We just take a percentage of the recordation taxes generated annually. And we're using that in a fund to build housing, to provide housing that is affordable. In the case of the community land trust house, it's a one-time investment that just rolls over and over and over again. What's important here is, Faraji, that fund would not exist had it not been for the citizens of Baltimore signing a petition that was accepted by then Mayor Pugh that created the fund. In fact, the fund is part of the city charter. I'm telling you, the community was smart. They knew what they needed to do in order to ensure this opportunity for generations to come. Now, that fund is managed by DHCD. Mm -hmm. and there's a commission that looks at that report monthly. So I urge your listeners to make sure that the last Tuesday of each month, they turn in, tune into the Zoom meeting held by the commission to make sure that the people's money is being spent the way the people intended it. 410-319-8888, folks. We're talking to the great folks at Northeast Housing Initiative here in Baltimore City, give, uh, giving out some fantastic information, but most importantly, providing a fantastic opportunity for home ownership and land ownership. Mm. Uh, um, I, I, I'm wondering, Brother Garrett to Denise, why is this such a new idea? Or is it not a new idea? Community land trust. I've, I've heard it was talked about before with even in uh, the mayoral campaign of 2016. I remember hearing it. I remember, you know, former mayor Sheila Dixon talking about it and others talking about it. My question is, though, is this, is this going to be, is this idea revolutionary enough to get us to a new place, but while at the same time, uh, moderate enough for people to invest in it. That's now, so an Denise, your face, question. <laughs> your, your, your face lit up. When I <laughs> That's an excellent question. First of all, let me share this. Charm City Land Trust in 2000, the board of directors made the legal moves in Annapolis to even enable the creation of a land trust. So they did that in 2000. Mm -hmm. In this nation, Places like Vermont and Boston have community land trusts. So, so in terms of decades, land trust has existed for at least 30 years. Okay. The, what's happened is, is that as the community becomes involved, this movement is developing traction nationally. Because for instance, when we had the housing crash of 2008, Folks who were in community land trust homes, only 1% of them defaulted. Whereas mm. you know how high the numbers were for everybody else. Absolutely. And that's because of the stewardship program. But I'm so glad you just asked this question and I lit up because in Washington DC, as we speak, there is legislation that is moving forward inside of the Congress. Congressman Ruthersberger has already signed on to it to create an earmark of federal dollars for community land trusts. A land trust provides housing for home ownership, 
but it also can provide incubators for businesses, green spaces for farming and gardens or mm. solar farms. And so that legislation is moving forward because what's happening is folks are recognizing the community has good sense. We know exactly what we need to do in order to move our agenda forward. Safety, security, owning land, and ownership of land is directly related to power. Now, that last statement that I made is key. Your listening audience, along with us, has to be vigilant because there are forces who will not want us to amass power as it relates to land and will do everything in their power to fight against that initiative. So I don't want anyone to be naive. I'm excited. I believe in the power of our people, but I want us not to be naive about the significance of this movement, especially Absolutely. around permanent affordability, because what's happening is at the pace that Garrick is discussing and multiply that by seven land trusts, you begin to reverse the racial wealth gap prediction. And what you also do in real time is the research shows for Raji that in any neighborhood where 51% of the homes are owned, all of the negative indicators, crime, grime, education, health, reverse themselves. I want to put you stop you right there. I want to get a couple of calls in very quick before we wrap up this part of the conversation. Ayana, thank you so much for checking in. What's your take? What's your question? Can you hear me, Faraji? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, I love your show and thank you for having this important information uh, disseminated that you listen to our community, number one. Number two, um, I'm a teacher in Baltimore City. I'm actually in, um, in the mindset right now on... Um, getting my credit where it wants to be to buy a home. My uh, my question is, and I know there, I, I, I'm sure there are many other things that are available, but how can we how can we set these things up so that we get this information much earlier to our people? I like, I was a student at Morgan State University and I always say to my friends, I wish that in our junior or senior years, we were, we were required to take a course in financial literacy and all these things because I grew up, my mother was very, very keen on us not worrying about money. So I didn't mm -hmm. even know how to write a check when I came to Morgan, okay? And so I really didn't know how to build credit. I'm still working on that stuff now in my 30s, but we, we really needed this information much earlier. And I also wanted to know, do you, do you all help people with like learning how to build their credit to be in the market to be able to, to buy a home? Because that is my my mission right now. Uh, I want to, uh, Yana, you bring up a great question. We got a few moments left. And Mr. Garrick, I want to give you a chance to kind of respond to Ayana about that. How can we have financial literacy, this type of knowledge earlier? And, and talk to us a little bit about how can people... Uh, check in with the Northeast Housing Initiative to, to get them set on the road to home and land ownership. Okay, two questions, um, Ayana, two answers. One, uh, there are uh, moves being made right now as we speak to get involved with uh, both Morgan and uh, Coppin State. I actually just did a class uh, last week at Coppin State uh, where I spoke about community land trust and just preparations uh, people can make in their junior and senior year. Uh, Two, uh, so some work is being done to make that happen. Maybe not fast enough, but you know we are making attempts. The second is uh, we do have uh, financial literacy classes that we do in partnership with several banks, PNC Bank and Fulton Bank. Um, and you can call us to um, schedule some time. That number is 1-800-726-9850. If you call that number, we can uh, put you in touch with our stewardship program and actually schedule you for some time to just assess where you are and see uh, how we can assist or do the appropriate, appropriate referrals that needs to be done if, you know, on a case by case basis. And Brother Garrett, that number right there, that, that goes directly to, to NEHA, correct? That is correct. All right, 1-800-726-9850. Sister Denise Jones-Dorsey, Brother Garrett, good. I appreciate you both for coming on to the show tonight. 
to share this. I mean, I know that it's blowing some people's minds. They're going to have to get the brain matter off the wall, Sister Denise, because they're trying to figure out, like, why haven't I not heard about this? Why didn't we know about this much, much sooner, like Ayana expressed? But I'm so happy that we are on a better path, that we are at this place to have this conversation. So again, we thank you so much for joining us this evening. Raji, grace and peace to you and to your listeners. And we're going to continue this struggle and make sure that folks know about what we're doing often. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Brother Gary. Brother thank thank you. you so much. I appreciate you. 1-800-726-9850 to get in touch with the Northeast Housing Initiative here in Baltimore.